Somebody shout out Jesus. Come on, shout it out one more time. Jesus. Come on, we're about to praise the name of the Lord. Sing, our God is greater. Say, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than it. Come on, declare it right now. Our God is a healer. Awesome in power. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God. Our God is God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power.
song a million times this year but I don't know if y'all really understand the words it says right there if our God is for us then who could ever stop us if our God is with us then what can stand against the scripture tells us if God be for us who can be against us come on if God be for us, I'm going to change it. What can be against us? Come on, sickness cannot stand against you tonight. Come on, your financial struggles cannot stand against you tonight. Come on, when the devil said no, God said yes. Come on, he has no authority. I want you to shout it out. And if our God is for us, say. And if our God is for us, Claire, then who could ever stop us? Declare Declare it. And if our God, and if our God is then who us, could ever? Then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? Come on, shout it out. Then what can stand? Then what can stand again? Come on, nothing in 2019 could hold you back. Then what? Oh, you're taking me forward, God. Nothing can stand again. Then what can stand again? With you all things to make new. Then what can stand again? 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 The Lord put something on my heart. For some, it will be inspiration. For others, it will be correction. But nonetheless, it will find you wherever you are. Sometimes the simple things are the most overlooked things, and we make assumptions about those kinds of things. I don't need that yet. Well, yeah, come, come on, bring it. Yeah, bring it. Show off that new jacket you got. <laughs> Some things, the simple things, are the things that we overlook most. And the Lord put in my spirit to correct you, if that's what is needed, or to encourage you, if that's what is needed, or to let you know that in so doing, that you're being blessed in doing so. Two scriptures I want you to read with me. One from the book of Psalms, and it's on the screen. You don't need to grab your Bibles. We're just going to read it from the screen, and uh, I want you to pay attention to what you're reading and listen to it. Let it rebound back into your spirit as we hear it. Let's read. Lord, who may abide? Always does what he promises. I want you to note that last line that says he always. I want you to read with me. He always does what he <clears throat> I want you to read that line again, just like a Rolls Royce just drove up with your name on it. All right. Read it. That's why you don't have a Rolls Royce. You don't know how to appreciate it. That's all the noise you're going to make about it. You won't get one. 
But he always does what he promises. And always means what? No matter how much it may cost. Second scripture. Ecclesiastes, the book of wisdom, chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. Let's read. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Just keep the scripture up while I talk. This is what the Lord told me to tell Mega Church. And he pointed out to me that a few Sundays ago, when Major Prophet Bernard Jordan was here, there were two figures that were given out, $80, and the larger figure was 2200 I believe. There were about 16 people in the first service, a number of you in the second service, Somewhere between 25, 30 people pledged $2,200. I want you to understand what happens when you pledge. When you make a pledge, a vow, a promise, flip the first scripture. I want you to take a look at the whole realm of truth. It's all about honoring God. It's not about honoring a man or honoring a church. It's about when you pledge and when you promise. That is your way of taking what you have to bring honor to God. And when you go that way, then the last line becomes yours. It becomes something that you must do no matter what you have to do to fulfill it. And you don't say, I made a mistake. Flip the scripture. You don't tell the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. Because at the time that you do it, it should be because something that was being said by the man of God registered in your spirit and you acted upon it immediately. It should not be because let me go ahead and do this and let God work it out along the way. Let me make installments, payments, and those kind of things because the pledge, the promise that you make to God, it rises above all of your other obligations. It becomes your chief obligation. Don't delay in following through. It becomes above your mortgage. It becomes above your car note. It becomes above anything that you have planned to do for yourself because you have made the promise to God to do it. And you don't put him in the mix with everything else that you have to do. He rises to the level of authority, a priority rather, and that becomes your priority, priority above anything else. Don't delay and follow through, because if you do, if you've done it for other motives, or other reasons, to look good, I'm the only one standing back here on my rope, so let me go. No, if you do it for any other reason, then you are a fool. And God takes no pleasure in stupidity, in foolishness. When you should have known that if it were the word of God that prompted you and made you do what you do, then that becomes your priority. If God did not prompt you to do it, then you shouldn't do it. It is better to say nothing 
than to make a promise and not keep it. So here's the deal. The Lord spoke to me and said, why should I fulfill my promise to a people who won't keep their word to me? That's how all this came about. How many of you are looking for God to do something in your life, something you want him to do, and you think it's a promise, you think he's promised it to you? Well, this becomes possibly a key for God to do it. As your bishop, as your authority, highest authority in this house, I'm saying to you this. I don't want you to buy a turkey until you fulfill your word. Don't go shopping for nothing. Not a Christmas present, nothing. Until you, 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 what you did, what you said, not me, but you did, what you said, until you see the importance of what you have said or did and do it. Now, if you've already done it, you're covered. God's taking care of you. You see, you're in there. But if you haven't, don't, don't put God on payment plan, installment plan. Do you want your blessings to be installed, paid little by little, $5 a week? No, no, no. When God moves you, you got to understand that if God moves you, then God's going to cover you in what you do to fulfill what he's prompting you to do. I told you, I don't brag about it, but I'm just telling you what God will do. The 105 at the beginning of the year that I gave, I gave it twice. I gave it in both churches. In three weeks, in three weeks, before January was out, I had $75,000 that I never knew was coming. People, three people gave me 10-5. Not 105, but 10-5. What I'm saying to you is that when you do what God says do, when you don't see any way, of what's coming. He said 105, 365. 105 is going to bless you through the 365 days of the year. God did that. My birthday, 10-5 came from, from San Fran. In birthday cards, shaking money out of cards, 10-5. What I'm saying to you, for me, me, it's not about money only. Yes, I'm a money man. I'm known as that, and I'm not... I'm, I'm not, I don't have any regrets about that. I have none. And if you, you got some, I'll take yours too today. But I don't have a problem with that. But it's not about money. It's about obeying God. And this is his way. This is his way that he set in the kingdom to get blessing to you. I'm giving away more money now than I've ever given in my life. I can't help but give. I saw someone in the hall today and went beside them and said, hey, how are things going? Of course, they, they said, things are going great. I said, uh, 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 And then the truth came out. I reached in my pocket and got a bill set here because I know where you are. This has happened every day. There's not a day hardly that goes by that I don't give somebody. Two days ago, I gave six people online money, PayPal, Zoom, money. Because I asked the Lord a long time ago, let the end of my days be giving. And so God just keeps pouring so I can give. If you don't give, you can't be a distributor. If you don't give, you cannot be a distributor. Because you have to give to get in order to distribute. So don't play with the pledges. Don't play with the promises. Don't play with what has come out of your mouth. 
Nobody made you. Nobody put a gun to your head and say, do this. You walked up here. I was shocked. Eight o'clock service, 16 people. Where did they get that money from? But when you say it, you become a fool not to do it. I didn't say that. You read it. I could give you many other scriptures. But this is my apostolic correction for you today. I'll bless you later on. But this is my correction to you. Now, Father, I pray that you would take what's on the screen and put it on the screen of their hearts. May they this week be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Benny, give me my second part of my song. We give you all the glory. Catch up as he plays. your Bibles. Since I made you sad, let me make you happy. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to read 10 verses. This is from the Message Bible because it says a little more in our language what I feel for this message and so I'm reading from message so it's best that you look on screen unless you brought your message Bible with you. Amen. amen. <laughs> no, I said amen. <laughs> I, I, I know we're programmed. It sounded like it's okay. Amen. But this is a man whose name is Amran, from the family of Levi, married a Levite woman whose name is Jochebed. It's in parenthesis because that's not in the scripture that way. The woman, Jochebed, became pregnant and had a son. She saw there was something special about him, spiritual x-ray vision, and hid him. What she saw, she hid. She hid him for three months. Type of the resurrection, death, burial, resurrection. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she got a little basket boat. Made of papyrus, waterproofed it with tar and pitch. Placed the child in it. Then she set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. The baby's older sister, Miriam, found herself a vantage point a little way off and watched 
to see what would happen to him, Pharaoh's daughter, Thermuthis, came down to the Nile to bathe. Her maiden strolled on the bank. And she saw the basket boat floating in the reeds and sent her maid to get it. She opened it, saw the child, a baby crying. Say those three words with me. A baby. A baby Say it again. A baby Say it again. A baby her heart went out to him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrew babies. She knew exactly who it was. Didn't surprise her. This must be one of the Hebrew babies. Then his sister, Miriam, was before her. Do you want me to go and get a nursing mother from the Hebrews so she can nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter, Thermuthis, said, yes, go. The girl went and called the child's mother, Jacobet. Pharaoh's daughter, Thermuthis, told her, take this baby and nurse him for me. I'll pay you. And we're just getting around to it in our time, paying the mamas for having babies. The woman took the child and nursed him. After the child was weaned, she presented him to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Mo, says, pulled out, saying, I pulled him out of the water. Somebody shout, when purpose cries. You might be seated. This is a fantastic story to me. I never preached it. And I won't be able to preach it all today. I was just looking, perusing down my notes, and there's just so much stuff I didn't touch, don't need to touch. So I'm, I'm looking for the Holy Spirit to take out of me what he wants for you in this service. Fascinating passage of scripture about Moses and most likely 99% of us overlook the details of this passage. I've never heard it preached. Doesn't mean it hasn't been preached. I just never heard it preached. I don't listen to preachers. I try to listen to God. I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. That's just me. And when I read this passage, over and over and over again and researched in depth because every, whenever God speaks to me, I spend a lot of time, 40, 80, 60 hours, whatever, a lot of time. And remember, I do this in both churches, so I study even more. But when I saw this, I marveled at God's ways, not our ways. And I understand why God's ways are not our ways because we would never be able to come up with what God comes up with and do what he does to fulfill it. God is unique. He is his own person. There is none like him. And yet men try to replicate him, duplicate him, repeat him. And God will let them go so far like he did Moses. Go ahead and throw down your rods. It becomes a snake. Try three out of the ten miracles. Yeah, okay. But there's a point that you give up. You can't do what God does because he's God. This passage, to give you a little background quickly, is we're dealing with Israel and Israel's history. In Genesis 15, 13, you can put it up, but I'll keep talking, that God said to Israel, I I'm going to put you through a rigid course of life for 400 years, take the zeros off, it has no value. Four becomes the value. Last Sunday I was at uh, Faith Fellowship and I preached on the fourth book. You know what the fourth book is? Of the Bible? Numbers. You see, the enemy has taken numbers and totally perverted it for us that we're scared to touch numbers. And we associate numbers with 7-Eleven. But God had numbers before anybody. And so this year, he has taken me on a numbers course. I, I have seen my life and my purpose 
through numbers. Person born the ninth month. I don't know why I'm getting on to this exercise because I'm getting way off. But the Lord had me take out my passport, my social security number, my driver's license, and my home address. And the predominant number for me is nine. I was born nine, September 19th, another nine, 19, another nine, 42. My house is in Arizona, 14328. You take 14, help me, accountant, 14, add it for me, 3, 2, 8, 18. But if you add 18, 1 and 8, so the Lord had me do this exercise. And my passport has double ones and double nines. And uh, the one is the Lord our God is one God, one Lord, one faith, one, 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 one. And then the nine, two nines, 99 on my passport, two nines. And then he took me to Genesis, Abraham, the Lord appeared unto him at the age of 99. And showed me what those two nines meant. I don't have time to go there. I'm just saying numbers are extremely important. Now, I don't play the numbers. I had an uncle who would always ask me, what did you preach yesterday? He wasn't interested in what I preached. He was going to try to take the numbers I used and go play it. Never worked for him. He died. So don't even try. Don't even try to take something I'm saying and, and, and run down to 7-Eleven. I want five in the middle of the stickers up there. No. <laughs> Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible. Four, universal. Numbers are universal. It's, they're God's uh, numerical system that he's put in the word and we overlook so many times. And I am amazed because every day I look at numbers. Every day I find truth about numbers. And here we have 400 years, which is a universal truth. That God is putting trouble in the path of his people. And suffering is very purifying. It gets stuff out of you that's in you, and you don't start praying until... He puts you through something. I'm sorry, Lord. I'll put down two cigarettes. Can I keep one? Yeah. You know, you, you don't start praying about being purged and renewed and things change until God puts you through something. You wouldn't be who you are if God didn't put you through something. Everyone lift your hands. Hi. Now thank God for what he's putting you through. Don't take him now. Thank you, Lord. Because what he's putting you through is the thing that's going to make you better. I, 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 I laugh. I laugh really today at my brother. Now when he was born, I named him. My mother told me to name him. Pick out a name. I did. I picked out a name. And I named him Richard Aldine because my uncle, my favorite uncle, who wanted to name me Cashmere. <laughs> D, why are you laughing up there in, in that box? I, I see you up there shaking, <laughs> shaking them braids. <laughs> he wanted to name me Cashmere. I said, so let me name this boy something sensible. And the one who wanted to name me Kashmir, I named my brother after him to put that burden on him. I wanted to share it with him. And uh, so he wouldn't ever forget his uncle who played the numbers off my numbers. <laughs> but his name was Richard Williams, Richard Aldean Williams. So I named my brother after him because I liked him. He, he didn't call me Kashmir, but he gave it to me. And he bought me my first Lincoln, my first car, Mercury. And then a Lincoln he bought for my grandparents that I drove. And he just did a lot of things for the family. And so I named my brother Richard. Now, he hates the name Richard. How are you going to hate something I gave him? You know? And you call him Richard. He's, I want all y'all to call him Richard for a month, OK? <laughs> But 
But sometimes we hate stuff that's going to be ultimately a blessing to us. Because if, you, if he ever looked up the name Richard and what it means and what it's indicative of, he would want to be called Richard Richard. And sometimes we are running from stuff and batting down stuff that God says, you need that to bless you. Don't knock it away. Don't knock that test away. Stop being resentful of where you are in life. Stop complaining about what you don't have and what others do have. The fact that you don't and they do says you're different. It says that you're special. It says that I'm doing something in you that I'm not doing in everybody else who has all this. And so, 400 years, Israel was being tested, stripped, in struggle. God, God made it hard for them. You think people are making it hard on you. God made it hard on them and said, you've got to serve time 400 years. We are interested in microwave. We are interested in shortcutting. Some of us want to shortcut the 400. Can you bring it down? Give me probation. Can you bring it down to 200 years? No, I said 400. And in that 400 years, Pharaoh, maybe different Pharaohs, because every king that mounted the throne in, in Egypt was named Pharaoh, God of Sun, Ra. They were gods. Every king, whoever this king, whatever Pharaoh this was at this time, the one at this end made things just absolutely miserable for everybody in life. And for families of Israel, it was hard because now they're in a position Move this thing after you wake up. <laughs> Was that nap good? <laughs> Everybody needs an armor bearer like that. Amen. <laughs> My men served me well. Brother, he, he drove me all over last week. I took the nap, so he's paying me back today. You see, but 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 things are happening in your life and. And you are uh, kind of uh, bent out of shape because certain things are going certain ways. And God says, you, sh you shouldn't be bent out of shape with that. That which you're bent out of shape with should be the very thing that you ought to praise me about. Only three of y'all got that. Are you still bent out of shape? Okay, all right. <laughs> And so Israel went through this. Families, imagine, families who had just birthed children, boys who they wanted all their lives. When they come forth now, they are worried, when will my baby be discovered and be killed? Because the king selfishly intimidated put out a mandate that every child in Israel two years and old or younger would be killed. And so he has put this mandate in place to kill every child. Have you ever heard of bad timing? God specializes in bad timing. When we think things are not ripe or ready. That's when God does it. And we think he's a little off. You see, our greatest problem is having the ability to fully, what was the last word I used? Fully, thank you, Elder Mac, you listen. Let me say it again because y'all didn't hear it, y'all sleeping. Our problem is, just kick somebody next to you, make sure they're awake. Our problem is, because the devil don't want them to get this, our problem is 
that we fail to fully trust God without making an excuse as to why we don't. See, I'm not popular because I'm not going the way of society, medicine, and uh, all that. I'm not. I just am not. I, I can't insult my God in my life like that. I'm not against anybody, nobody, for doing what they need to do. This is me. I preached 70 years, faith, trust, God, what he will do. I'm at the point in life that either I fully embrace my message and walk in it, or I abandon it and make an excuse for why I did. You and I will never see the full blessing of God until we learn how to fully trust him. Friday, I make my seventh trip out of the country on this coming Friday. I get on the plane like everybody else. They don't know. They don't know if I've been. And because of, who would ever think the controversy of the nation for a year and a half is going to be how many shots you got? You got one, but you better get another one. I have a friend that says, I'm going to get every booster they put out. Well, you go ahead. What, what, what is it doing for you? They gave you a shot and said, that will cure you. Gave you another one, that's going to keep you. Now you get a third one. And now there's a fourth one. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and just to take him what? No condemnation. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. God knows I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to give you a point. That when will I, when will you, when will we get to the place that we fully trust God? Now, I understand that there are workers in medicine and health and whatnot. They're forced to take it if they want to keep their job. Why don't y'all force me to take it so I can leave my job? <laughs> So I understand that there are people who, if they want their job, that you're forced to do it and, and, and do so because we need your tithes. So keep, 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 keep those jobs. You see, keep them. But my point is that at what juncture in your life, at what point, at what place in your life that you will say, you know, God, you got this one. I'm going to fully Trust you with this. When? What will it take? What will go on in your life that you will say, I'm going to fully trust you. And God will get you to a place that you have no choice but to fully trust him. These families we're listening to every day, men sent out from the king's house, Looking, do you have a two-year-old? Give him to the state. Or bring your knife. Take his life right in front of the parents. Two years old. I mean, let's be real. These are real families, real mothers, real dads. A mother who has just birthed this child a year and a half or two years ago. And now she's watching his head being severed from his body just because of a king who is selfish, selfishly intimidated, whose throne is selfishly intimidated, and he puts a mandate out. What I need you to see today, some are hearing it twice, hear it again, that God is able to use the most minute thing to work out his purpose in your life. 
the smallest thing. I want you to see when God got ready to deliver Israel, you would think that he would send an army, give them weapons, give them 50,000 horses, and say, go get them. Go wipe out Egypt. Ah, I got you. No, he didn't use all of this grandioso behavior and magnificent military and heroes. To no, he didn't do all that. What he used to get the party started, what he used to get his deliverance act going was the very king who gave the mandate. He looked at Thermuthis his daughter, and say, hey, babe, don't you smell yourself? Time to take a bath. He just put it in her heart that it was time, at that time, the right time, the only time, it's time for you to go and take a bath. What's the big deal? She gathers, I mean, read it, you read it. She gathered all of her maidens and marched down to the river. It's bath time. She gets down to the Nile River. Now, you, if I had time, I'd talk about the Nile that's over 4,000 miles that serves 11 countries. It's an information route. That's how information got from place to place to the Nile River. But the Nile River, 4,656 miles, I believe it is, uh, or 52, it, it's a dangerous place. It has all kind of dangerous animals from point to point to point to point. And yet, when Jacobed, the mother of this baby, when she wanted to hide him for three months, death, burial, and resurrection, hidden. When she wanted to hide him for three months, took him down to the most dangerous river on planet Earth and put him there in the reeds and bulrushes, but put him, <laughs> I like this line that the Lord gave me. I wish I could say it two or three times, but y'all will get tired of it. But he, she put him in a basket, that's why I like this translation, it was a basket boat. And I, when I read the messenger, I thought, a basket boat. Let me tell the people, you don't have to be a basket case if you got a basket boat. Because this basket boat was pitched with tar. Just like Noah's ark was pitched. And the pitch and the tar was a symbol of the blood of Jesus that covered the basket and covered Noah's ark. And it sealed it. That water, which is a type of judgment, could not get into the basket or into the ark. And those who were in the ark or in the basket were sealed with grace and mercy. And that could not escape them. And the mother had taken care of this baby in this basket boat made of papyrus. Papyrus is paper. You've got Moses in the Nile River the place of information flowing back and forth, and you got Moses in a basket where it's papyrus, which means paper, which means that he is a type of something being written. He wrote the Ten Commandments. And this, that Ten Commandments is now going to flow up and down the Nile River, and the Nile River covered 11 countries. 11 countries covered by this. And Moses was the architect 
of what was written on that papyrus for the deliverance of Israel who had served time for 400 years. Here Thermuthis is coming down to the Nile River to take a bath. When she's taking a bath, she looks up and sees in the bulrush, in the reeds, this is another message, the ram that was in the bush, deliverer. She looks up and sees this boat, basket boat. Go, hey, go ch let's go check out this boat. When, when she takes and removes the top, the lid, <laughs> the mercy seat, oh, Lordy, she removes it. And at that point, at that moment, at that moment, God touches the baby and says, cry. When he touches the baby and the baby cries, then he turns around and touches her heart. And she opens her heart to the cry. This is the king's daughter who's under the same mandate as everyone else, that when you see a Hebrew child, take him and kill him. She should have killed him, but rather than kill him, she loved him. Yeah. Loved him to the point that the spy, Miriam's, Miriam, who was Moses' daughter, uh, Moses' sister, was watching every day, see what was going to happen to the basket. Three months she stood there, watching. And when... King's daughter, Thermuthis, made her move. Miriam came and says, Your Highness, would you like a nurse for your child? Oh, yes. Can you find me one of the Hebrew women? Who will nurse this child? I mean, come on. Who's walking around with milk and they breast <laughs> but it just so happened that this young girl Miriam knew exactly who had some milk her mother because her mother had just delivered the child let me hasten on I would love to make a point there because uh, Josephus and Jot Jotton are the philosophers they both write and says that before they got to Jacobed, I don't know how true this is, but this is history, that they contacted many women and tried them out to see who Moses would take to. And out of all the women that Moses tried, no, you ain't the one, baby. And he kept sucking and sucking and sucking until they brought Jacobed there. And when he was suckling on her breast, he took to her. And Miriam, the sister, took him to the palace. And they cared for him and nursed him until he became of such that they were able to present him to Thermuthis and she adopted him as a son. Now listen, that when she removed the lid and found this baby, the Bible says she found a baby crying. The Holy Spirit spoke to me when I read that and said, was it the cry that saved him? I thought about it. 
No, it could not have been his cry because babies were crying all over the place. What was it about the cry of Moses that saved him? And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, it was not his cry, it was his purpose that was crying. And when a man, baby dog, come here, come here. Come to me. You can run until you run ragged. Look at my eyes. You can try to rebel against everything and everything and everything you've ever known or been told. But today I declare for your life a struggle that you won't be able to come out of until you surrender fully to the will of God. You are marked, young lady. Try what you will. You won't be able to get far from it. The day will come that you'll remember these words. Run as far as you want to run. Do what you think you want to do. But the day will come that God will humble you. And you will say yes as well. Goodbye. This baby cried. No, he didn't cry. Purpose cry. And a man or woman, anybody have purpose? Anybody know that you're here for a purpose? Do, come on, do you know that you are here for a purpose? Anybody who knows they're here for a purpose, jump up and say, I'm here for a purpose and sit down and say. <laughs> Jermaine, you're getting close to showdown. Getting close to showdown. That you are here for a purpose and anybody who is here for a purpose, you can't die. You can't quit. You can't give up because purpose won't let you die. Purpose won't let you quit. No matter what comes in your life, you might be in the basket in the Nile River with the alligators, the crocodiles, the snakes, and everything else, and you're an you become an endangered species. But because you have purpose, God won't let the alligators, the crocodiles, the snakes, the monkeys, the gorillas touch you. Because you have purpose and purpose can't be touched. Purpose can't be destroyed. That's why Luther Blackwell is preaching you today at 79 years old. Ooh. Because I got purpose. Purpose won't let me get sick. Purpose won't let me go to the hospital. Purpose won't let me be crippled. Purpose won't let me be stiff. Purpose won't let me be scared. Purpose won't let me be afraid. My God has not given me the spirit of fear. But if he didn't give it to you, where are you getting it from? Getting it from CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, but not from God. At 6.30 tomorrow night, don't turn on your news, turn on God. See what God has to say about you and your life. You and your life. You and your life. I was at breakfast yesterday. And right at breakfast, there was a group of men from Africa, and uh, they saw something in me. I was dressed with a casual, I had written, I was dressed loud. <laughs> I know they weren't going to see no God in me. <laughs> but they, we start talking, 
and, and just sitting there, one of the boys, young men, they're here to start a church in the city, Africans, and, and they said, there's something about this man. I said, is it my feeler? I had a feeler, outfit on. They say, I said, my feeler? You like my feeler? He says, no, 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 no. And, and the prophet over them, they went and got him from the hotel room and said, come meet this man. There's something about him. You see, purpose, no matter how you try to hide it, yes. won't let you be hid. And then when I left them, <laughs> I went to Walmart just to pick up a battery because I didn't have that size battery to, to fit in my remote bed that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And so I went and got a battery. When I walked out of the store, somebody said, hey, Bishop, you know me? Yes. And I started ministering, ministering to them right there on the, the parking lot. No Walgreens. On the parking lot. And they said, God sent you. He did. He should have told me I would have dressed like a bishop. <laughs> God sent you. And you've answered my question. I've been wondering about ABC, XYZ, and you've given me the answer. You see, purpose won't let you hide Purpose won't let you disappear. Purpose won't let you blend in to fit the fabric of society. You're a man, you're a woman with a purpose, and purpose is crying out of you. Purpose is crying out of you. When you go to work tomorrow, purpose will cry. You're not here to get a check. You're not here to make a living. Purpose, crying. Open your eyes. Somebody needs help. Somebody needs your blessing. Somebody needs your deliverance. Somebody needs to be set free. Purpose, crying. And a man, hurry up. You stiff today? Hurry up. Walk up, walk up. Walk up. That's right. Walk up. Purpose. Thank you. Purpose made so come up here and give me this envelope. Purpose. <laughs> Demetrius thinks he said, I wish I was like that. You can be. But you got to be crazy to serve purpose. You got to be crazy. People look at you stupid. Are you for real? Yes, I'm for real. You see, hundreds of years later, and I close, there was a man whose name was Herod. He was also a self-serving king. And he repeated history. He too, at the birth of Jesus, tried to assassinate him, but he didn't know where he was. And so he put out a mandate. Imagine somebody willing to kill every baby in a nation just to kill one so he can save his job. You got to be extra to do that. You got to be insane to disregard the lives of little children just for your own selfish interests. Jesus is a baby. He can't help himself. That's when he planned the attack, when he was a baby. The enemy is trying to destroy many of your gifts, not after you develop them, but now when they're in baby form. And Herod says, kill every baby that's two years old and under. So God says, Joseph, Mary, take him to Egypt. Let him stay there for two years. Two years later, all right, going out. Purpose is being served. You see, purpose won't let you die. Purpose won't let anybody kill you. 
Stop worrying about folk talking about you. What do you care? Stop worrying about people saying things about you on your job. Who she thinks she is. Who do you think you are? Who, 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 who? Ask somebody, who do you think you are? Come on, ask them. Who do, speak through that mask. Who, who do you think you are? Come on. You, you, you've got to know who you are. Brother Donald, you got to know who you are. You got to know who you are. And if you know who you are, you ought to know what you have. And if you're a man, a woman, a purpose, it doesn't matter whether people like you, don't like you. It doesn't matter that Bishop is crazy. It doesn't matter what you say about me. Don't you want to be crazy like me? Oh, hallelujah. It doesn't matter doesn't matter because I happen to be not only crazy, but blessed while I'm at it. Amen. Can have what I want, go where I want to go, do what I want to do when I get ready, and don't have nobody to tell me differently except Alana, Stacy, and Megan. <laughs> nobody. I see Lois coming out at one, then I see Lois coming out at another. Here comes the Lois. I say, Lord, have mercy. Let me get out of here. Let me, get, let me lead the country. <laughs> let me lead the country, baby. But when you understand that you got purpose, preacher, when you understand that you got purpose, you can't die. No matter what the devil does. Wherever you think the devil is, shout to him, say, I can't die. <laughs> did, did you speak or vomit? What did you do? <laughs> Jeez. There's nothing like knowing who you are and what you are and shouting it, crying it. The baby cried right in the face of the one who was trying to kill her, kill him. And rather than being able to kill him, she fell in love with him. <laughs> Took him into the house. I close. Took him into the house. King, hey, King, whose baby is that? That's my grandbaby. In the Hebrew, is it? You see, you got to make up some kind of lie. He, he, I guess y'all not supposed to hear the rest of it. Okay. But he has to provide for the person that's going to deliver the people of Israel, children of Israel, out of his hands. He has to provide for the baby. He got to get the baby diapers. He got to get the baby infant meal. He's got to get, and then he's got to turn around and put the mother on payroll right. to take care of her own baby. Yeah. That's what Biden is trying to do now. Jesus. We late. This was done hundreds of years ago. You see, when you are a man, a woman, a purpose, God will make your enemies serve you. He will make your enemies your footstool. He will make your enemies bless you because you're a child of purpose and purpose, when it cries, it touches and changes and converts and remakes and reconfigures and reconstructs things in order that they might line up with the will, the purpose, the plan of God for the man or the woman who has purpose. Every one of you who has purpose, leap on your feet and holler.
All right, sit back down. Sit back down a moment. There's some folk right back in here, right, right, right in the, up in here, who didn't jump up and say nothing because they don't have no purpose. First thing with people of purpose, they have to learn to obey. Is that why you don't have a church now? No, sir. Oh, okay, okay. I just wonder. When I say everybody, that excludes no one. You understood? Teach him. <laughs> that if you have purpose, your first line of duty is to obey. Moses was obedient. The Bible said that Moses was the meekest man in the whole nation. And he wrote that about himself. Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? It says Moses, parenthesis, the meekest man who ever lived. That's me. <laughs> what? When you're a man and woman of purpose, you know who you are. I want everybody except Elder G. I don't want him to do no damage. Everyone, he said he's jumping up to sit. He can jump up. I can sit down. Everyone of purpose. The baby cried. It wasn't the baby. It was purpose. And I want every one of you who has purpose and know that you have purpose and the enemy can't take it away from you to jump up now and cry. Holler, shout. Stand on your feet. Hallelujah. I want everybody to let nothing that God has for you get in the way. So I want everybody to sow. And if you haven't paid your pledge, I want you to sow whatever you sow, sow on it today. I want Megan to understand that we are called church in this city and we're not just a church on the west side in a racial church having some some of this race and that race no that's not we have purpose yes. and when we start understanding that we have purpose God's going to do some things you know Bishop been talking about doing this for a long time building the church but we've been saying that here ever since I've been there remember God put Israel on hold for 400 years we still have 370 more to go. But you can't time God. You can't calculate what he says, what he's doing. Let him do it. I want everyone here to take and sow into your purpose. Sow into your future. Sow into your future. And then I ask you, how big is your future? Is is it only $5 worth? That's, that's, that's your future? Your future's no bigger than $5? And you pay $200 a month for direct TV? You pay $120 to get your hair did? $60 for get your hair, your nails done? done? And yet, when it comes to your future, you're going to reduce it to $5, $10, Come on, so into your future. Why do you want God to fulfill his word to you if you cannot fulfill your word to him? If you can't obey him, then why should he listen to you? Individually, we are people of purpose, but corporately, we're a church of purpose. I have one more year to serve you directly. And I want to see this church become everything that God wanted it to be under my administration. If it's the last day of my tenure here, and that's when the church is starting to go up, so be it. The 
And I want to know and say like Paul, I have finished that part of my course. I've kept the faith. And henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness that God the righteous judge shall give me, not to me only, but to all those Lift your hands. I want to pray for every one of you. As long as you have something in your hand. Don't, don't, don't lift. If you have an empty hand, sit down. I can't do empty today. If you can't trust God and you don't believe God, you didn't you listen to 45 minutes and you don't hear nothing I've said, anything I've said that prompts your faith to, to this is for you. You're sowing into your future, not mine, yours. Sowing into your purpose so it will grow. Watch it grow right in the presence of your enemies. Watch them anoint your head with oil right in the presence of your enemies. Watch him do great and mighty things with you. Even when the bear is lying, growling, and the children are mocking. Right in the presence of all that. He's fulfilling purpose through you. Lift them high. Lift them high. Lift them. Father, I have the apostolic authority in this house. I speak not only to the lives, but over the lives. I pray that those who are at the very end when Satan is cutting up worse than he's ever cut up before. I pray that they will be able to drop something of you into their basket of faith, of tar and pitch, the blood of Jesus, where you will not allow judgment to come in or grace and mercy to leave. I pray that the purpose for every life in this house, from the top right down to seemingly like the least of all, that purpose shall be fulfilled.